reading Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Now I don't think we have anyone here this morning who is a powerful executive of a large company or indeed even the owner of their own business, their own company, who is involved in millions of pounds and making vital decisions that could make or break uh, the business or other businesses. But there are parents, and I say parents, there are people who are parents and who are in that kind of position, who have powerful jobs and much influence in society. Think of politicians at this time. Great influence in society that they have. But many of them, as I say, are parents. And the question is, I wonder how many there are who have some high-powered position in society and are seen as being very prestigious or uh, someone to be respected, someone worthy of acclaim for their role in society and yet are negligent when it comes to the rearing of their children. I remember a man who was a millionaire and he had a wife and a son, and the son was spoiled for every good thing that there was. I say good thing, every toy that is. He's a young lad and he had pretty much everything. Christmas time, the home had a fireplace that you could actually walk and stand up in. It's huge. And it was filled with presents for this boy. This boy opened all the presents and he didn't know what to do. Afterwards, he was discovered playing with a box. 
Just a simple box. But if you'd ask that child, and indeed if you were to ask many children who perhaps have got all things, but mum or dad are hardly ever there, what do you want for Christmas? Or what do you want for your birthday? Or what do you want more than anything? I want you. I want you. I want my dad or I want my mum to spend some time with me. I want them to, well, to treat me as precious. There are many people who have excellent jobs or are excellent in their job. And yet they fail here. And yet this is surely for the parents, for any person who has a child, surely this is the greatest responsibility. Now as Christians, we are to nurture our children as God indeed nurtures us. We've seen how we're to avoid extremes, on the one hand, beating them to submission, that's an extreme that's to be avoided, but tragically it's been the case at times past largely in this country now, in our history, but of course still going on in places in the world. But then we're to avoid the other extreme, which is to say, oh, you, know, you must never punish them, never, never, ever punish them, don't want to harm them in any way. And we've seen and we understand that if we are to be good, godly parents in the upbringing of our children, the word of God needs to be central in the parent's heart and life. And so in Ephesians chapter 6, last week we, we came to verse 4 and we looked at the negative side of this balance, because that's what we need is Balance. We need it in the whole of the Christian life, but we certainly need it in the rearing of our children. And we saw last week, fathers, do not exasperate your children. And I put that as the negative side of it, because some of the things we were considering was those parents who have no self-control. Don't exasperate your children. You've got no self-control. You fly off the handle. You know, the, the child's done something wrong and it's the last straw. And now they're really for it. But you don't know how to control yourself. Or you're the parent who, again, negatively, is changeable. One moment, uh, some form of behaviour is acceptable. Another time it isn't. It just depends on the mood that you're in, in a sense, linked again with self-control. Or there are those parents who are unapproachable. Can't come to me. Don't come to me now. Don't bother me with, with me with that now. I've got too many things on my mind. And as I suggested, when a parent is too often like that, the child gets the impression that I'm not actually that important. I don't really matter. I don't really care to them. They're more concerned about their high-powered job than they are about me. And then there are those who, of course, take the approach of anything for an easy life. Do what you want. Do what you want. Just don't bother me. And kind of anything goes. And as I suggested last week, that can produce a, a kind of an exasperation in hindsight. The child looking back and really being quite bitter, and now he's grown up or she's grown up, being quite bitter about the way in which their parent didn't really control them. Just let them do anything, and it's ruined them. And that ruins so many young people, I believe, in our day to day. Discipline should be in the home. Discipline is, in it, when it's done in the correct way, is a mark of love. We've read that this morning in Ephesians here, in um, chapter 12 of Ephesians. And in... <laughs> Thank you. Just testing. <laughs> in, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, <laughs> verse 5, being addressed as sons, the word of encouragement addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. The Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as sons. God does this. The passage is implying that fathers are to do this. Indeed it says this, that fathers are to do this. But God does it much better. 
But you see, fathers and mothers, we're to follow the example of God, follow the ways of God, and then we can do it better, can't we? Then in verse 8 he says, If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children, and not true sons. Well, that's how it is with God, but then think of the family, and think of this anything for an easy life, and you're not disciplined. Well, you're not really true sons. How is that a display of the love that God has for you, uh, sorry, the love that your father has for you as his child? It's not, is it? There's no discipline. It's as though he doesn't care. So they don't really care about you. And then in verse 9 you read, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. So... That's a key verse as well, isn't it? Those are key words, aren't they? We respected them for it. If your discipline is done in love, the child won't hate you. They won't grow up and hate you because you exercise discipline. They will respect you for it. Because they see that it's been done in love. And that your concern is ultimately for their good, for their improvement. They're, they're, sorry, their concern is for you and for your improvement. That as you grow and develop, you grow and develop in the right way. And so we, in looking at those things last time, we considered how, wolf, we need wisdom. We need wisdom. Well, that sent us back to chapter 5 of Ephesians, where it speaks about wisdom, exercising wisdom, but then it led us into verse 18. Because not only do we need wisdom, but we need courage. Because the world says, no, 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 don't do it this way. And even family members say, no, no, don't do it this way. And as children get older, teen years and what have you, then the pressures are, are greater to compromise and to say, oh, well, okay, it's, it's all right then if you want to go and to this particular place where this and that activity is taking place and so on. Anything for an easy life, you've got to have courage. Courage to do the right thing and to say no. And to me, where do we get that from? Where do we get the wisdom from? Well, we get the wisdom from the Word of God, of course, but it's the Holy Spirit who applies it. And so we concluded last time by saying, going back to Ephesians 5, verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with Him. And the more we're filled with the Holy Spirit, then the more we'll be able to exercise wisdom because he will be the one imparting it to us through the word of God. And the more we'll be able to exercise our discipline, our counsel as it were, with courage and boldness to resist the compromising and the standards of the, the world today. So in other words, the Holy Spirit brings that self-control Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And it puts us back in control. Back into control to raise our children in God's ways. But now let's consider then the positive side of balance in rearing children. And the second part of verse 4 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, it says, Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So if we consider on the positive side, this balance, let us consider first of all, the raising and training. The words I want to just explore here, in this training, or bring them up rather, training and instruction. Bring them up, training and instruction. I mean, those words, terms, they appear straightforward, don't they? In one sense, they're straightforward. And you can just, well, that's fair enough. Bring them up, yes. Raise your children. Training, instruction, yes, makes sense. But actually, as with so much of Scripture, there's so much to be gained by looking deeply into the words. And sometimes searching out the actual Greek meaning of the word. And looking at where these words or these terms have been used elsewhere in Scripture. So, that's what I'd like to do. Raising and training. The first word or term we have here is bring them up. Bring them up. Actually, in the Greek it's a word that's nurture. Nurture. And it means to nourish. To feed. 
nurture, to nourish, to feed, to rear, to bring up to maturity. And it's applied to the whole person, cultivating the whole person, mind and spirit. Bring them up, nourish them, feed them, rear them, bring them up to maturity. Cultivate the whole person, mind and spirit. If you turn back to chapter 5, the same word is used there. Bring them up in chapter 5 verse 29, part of a, uh, a wider argument in the relationship of husbands and wives. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it. <coughs> Excuse me, just as Christ does the church. Feeds and cares is the same Greek word as bring them up. Feeds and cares, bring them up. It's the same Greek word. So, in other words, parents are to feed and to care, to guard their children as Christ does the church. Because husbands are to do that for their wives, just as Christ does, <coughs> excuse me, the church. And now here, parents are to do that, are to feed, are to care, are to guard their children. And it brings to mind where Jesus says, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've longed to gather you together as my children, as it were. Just as a, a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you think it's a wonderful picture. You think of a hen with the chicks nestled, snuggled up under the wings. You think of a child in the arms of their parents. How safe you feel, don't you? How safe when you're a child and your mum's holding you or your father's holding you. Maybe there's a lot of people, maybe you're out somewhere and there's turmoil, turmoil there's things going on. But your father takes you up into his arms. And as far as you're concerned, when you're a very young child, Nothing can stop your father's hold. Nothing can break that hold. He's the strongest man alive. That's what I thought of my father. The strongest man alive. And if I'm in his arms, I am truly safe. Truly secure. And so the child feels safe. Feels safe. Feels loved. And that, bring them up, is what the term is implying there. Parents, raise your children in a secure home where they feel there is love, where they feel secure. Now I know that you know, we live in, uh, well, whatever days we live in, we live in a fallen world, so my father's hold could have been broken by a stronger man, let's say. But leaving that aside, the child should have that sense that when they are with you, they are secure. And that being with you brings that stability, brings that security, brings that love, brings that care. So the parent who, in a rage, self-control again, no self-control, says, Oh, I hate you. To their child. Could a parent ever say such a thing? What a dreadful thing to say. You know, one of the things I read somewhere before Susan and I got married was, when you're married... One thing you should never, ever say to your wife or your husband. I want a divorce. Actually, from a Christian perspective, that's not a thing you can say. Because you, well, you may want it, but you can't have it. <laughs> because you're married under God. Two are made one flesh. But to say, I want a divorce, in a fit of rage. I mean, thankfully, I've never had opp I say opportunity. I've never been in a situation. <laughs> never been in a situation where I've ever wanted to say such a thing. Whether, whether I put my wife in that situation where she might have wanted to, I don't know. But it's not something that you should ever say because even in just a temper, it puts doubts. It puts uncertainty there. It takes away that security, doesn't it? It takes away from that safety and that feeling of everything is secure. How much more of a child? For a child to hear a parent say, I wish I'd never had you. What does that do to their sense of security? 
So let's bring them up. Nourish them, feed them, rearing whole person, mind and spirit. But then we have here the word training. Training, and it's quite simple, it means to teach. But it actually, more than that, it means to teach by act and discipline. Act and discipline. So if we think of teaching, training to teach, if you turn to 2 Timothy, the famous verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Teaching. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training. It's the same word as the one in 2 Timothy. Teaching. Bring them up in the teaching. Here we have it translated as training. And in Timothy, we have it translated as teaching. But it's the same word. So what does that tell us? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Scripture is useful for teaching. Fathers or parents, bring up the children, bring up your children in the teaching, in the training. It tells us that the word of God, the word of God is what we should use in the teaching of our children. Training your children, teaching your children, bring them up in the word of God. Use the word of God in that process. But I said that word training, to teach, by act, and by discipline. Same verse, stay in Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Same word translated. Rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That is the same word, training. You see, act, to teach, by act and by discipline. And in Ephesians 16, 3, 16, the training is act. Because you're, you're teaching them how to act in ways that are righteous. Training in righteousness. No, that's wrong. This is the way. This is the righteous way to live, as it were. And there's more to say on action, but I'll come to that later. In other words... The Bible is our tool for godly living. And if we were to go on to verse 17, so that the man of God, or the child, who becomes a child of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then discipline. Discipline. The word training means to teach by act and discipline. If you go to our main reading this morning, Hebrews 12, actually... That word, training or teaching, and thinking of it in the context of discipline, it's used six times in the New Testament. We've read uh, from it, in, other than where we are in Ephesians, it's twice in Timothy, and it's four times in Hebrews, in the passage that we've read. I won't read all of them, but just come to the last of them, and the last one that's used is in verse 11. Where it says, no discipline. Same word as training. Same word as teaching. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So it's clear that this word training isn't just teaching, and it isn't just action. It also involves chastising. It also involves discipline. Because if it's just teaching, actually teaching can be fun. Teaching can be enjoyable, should be enjoyable. But discipline, being punished... No discipline seems pleasant at the time. Well, it doesn't, does it? You see, so it's all three of those things. Teaching by action and discipline. Training the child. And then the third word, the third word is instruction. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And the word instruction means to rebuke, means to reprimand, means to warn, to exhort, to counsel. 
also involves really encouraging them as well to all those things. Encourage them, encouraging them to the right way of action, the right way to live. It's used three times in the New Testament as warning. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 11 we read. These things happen to them as examples. These are things that have happened that are bad as it were. Evil things that have happened because of the way that the Israelites were living. These things have happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfilment of the ages has come. Warnings is the same word as instruction in Ephesians 6 4. It's warnings. Warnings. And then in Titus. Chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Actually, literally, it is, uh, it is after the first and second warning, which is the same word, instruction. So it's only once in the original. The NIV has put it twice, but it should literally read, after the first and second warning. And it's a milder term used here in Ephesians 6, it's a milder term used to complement that word training, teaching. We'll put these both together, training and instruction, and it includes an appeal. As it were, as you do these things, you're to appeal to the will and the reason, to the conscience, to the will and the reason of the child. You see, they need a mind reset. The mind needs resetting. We're born sinners. We're born with a wonky mind. We're born with a wonky real will. We're born with a wonky reason. The mind is set wrong. It needs resetting. So parents, train, instruct your children through the word of God, to reset their mind, to give them the right focus, to give them the right understanding of things, to set them right where they are wonky. Now would you take your children and go and live in a cave somewhere? Is it, imposs- is it possible actually, in this day and age, to live in a... Could you live in a cave and not receive uh, a reception for your phone? <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe you'd find a way, you'd get some area up or something to do it. That seems to be such a needy thing today, is that? But, you know, what I'm trying to point out here is that actually escaping from the world is unavoidable, really, isn't it? You say, oh, I shelter my children from all these worldly things. But it's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. And just as we're to, well, what are we to do? We're to bring them up, in other words, to nourish, to feed them. Word of God, but yes, physical food as well, just as we're to feed them, well, they're surrounded by this world. And it's unavoidable that they'll be feeding on the world. It's constant. Constantly bombarded by it. And if we're not careful as parents, they'll be nurtured, raised on the world's food. And ultimately, from the Christian point of view, the world's food is anti-God. That's a fact. Anti-God. So, through warning, through instruction, through example from the Word of God, not your wisdom, the Word of God. So there's the person who's the rough-looking parent, Perhaps he's not rough looking, but he's an older man. And he says, I had the strap when I was little, it never harmed me. And he takes the strap off and takes it to his children. No, that's not the way. It's not your wisdom. It's God's wisdom. Through the word. One last verse here from uh, Hebrews, and it's verse 10. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Bear, so, you know, in verse 11, verse 10, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. So here's a strap, I think that's best for you. You know, they think best. Perhaps he means well by it. But God disciplines us for our good. So if we, were be, if we would be those parents who will discipline our children for their good, then we need to have the mind and the focus and the, the, the wisdom of God, don't we? So we need the word of God in order to do such things. The word of God is our ultimate counsel and our guide to show the right way to go and to warn against the wrong way. So that's the terms, and that's uh, perhaps the difficult part. But let me ask you this question. If you've been a parent, or you aspire one day to be a parent, or that's something that's passed you by, but you look at other parents and what have you, and it's easy to look at other parents and say, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> and if you ask them, they'd say, I wish I hadn't done it that way as well. <laughs> that's a fact, isn't it, oftentimes. But what's a parent's ultimate call? The ultimate call of the parent. Is it that we want our children to grow up to be good citizens? Not now perhaps of the European Union, but uh, good citizens. Good citizens. We think of the proverb, train a child in the way they should go. When they're older, they'll not depart from it. Well, I want them to be good citizens. Raised in a, in a Christian home, they, they, they should be good, shouldn't they? So therefore you would agree surely that it's the duty of Christian parents, indeed it's the duty of every parent in society, but particularly the duty, duty of Christian parents to teach morals, to teach manners. We'd agree with that, wouldn't we? But that's surely not the ultimate call for the parents. I would put it like this, that it is the particular call of the Christian. The Christian parents. It is their duty to train and instruct their children in the ways of the Lord. That's surely the ultimate call. To raise them in the training, the fear of the Lord. We read that children are to obey their parents in the Lord and now we read that parents are to raise their children in the ways of the Lord see so children are to obey in the Lord that's the most important thing for them isn't it honour and obey in the Lord fathers, mothers raise your children up in the ways of the Lord the supreme call of the Christian parent is just this. It's not the Sunday school teacher. It's not their supreme call. It's amazing, really, that something that started as an outreach for unchurched children in so many churches today is actually a part of the main service. And so that what happens, and you've probably seen this if you've visited other churches and things, what happens is after the second hymn, uh, or sometime during the, the, the meeting, usually it's after the second hymn, the children all totter off out. And they go off for their own church, as it were. Well, be that as it may, what is tragic in that is where the parent sees that as the time of the week, and indeed the only time of the week, where little Johnny, little Sarah, is to have his and her Bible time. That is their time for instruction from the Word. I'm the parent, I'll pray with them and so on, but now they're, they're getting someone who's qualified to, to teach them the Bible. We may delegate... The general education of our children to others, I mean that's been the tradition now for some generations and society has many good resources to do that and I don't want to get into that now, but we may delegate there. But in terms of the spiritual instruction of our children, parents, we have the prime role. The prime role. And others, 
Well, we may have other people bringing God's word to our children and so on. But that doesn't take away and shouldn't take away from it being the primary task of the parent. One of the things we can do in that, of course, is to encourage them in reading. Encouraging them in reading the Bible. Encourage them in reading uh, good Christian literature. So biographies that are suitable for their age are usually can be quite entertaining, quite exciting. But anything like that, whether it's another person, whether it's a book that they're reading, all these things should be complementary to your own, to the parents' teaching, training in the instruction of the ways of the Lord through the word of God. They are secondary to what the parent does. It certainly was so in Old Testament times. You turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll just read verse 4 and from there you can read the whole passage. But hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now yes, there's only one reference to children. Impress them on your children. But talk about them when you sit in a home. Where are your children? They're there. They hear about these things. They're tied on you. They're on the door frames. They're all around. Mum, Dad, why is this? What is this? It's there for them to see. And it's something that is your focus. So they see this time and time again and you know it's so easy to neglect so easy to neglect the spiritual aspect so easy to neglect the instruction for our children from the word of God easy to leave it to others and I think as well it's one of the areas that in the home you face most attack I mean we've, we've suffered with that recently area where it can be so easily attacked and yet it should be a priority and you have to say that really you know just as you have your own daily some people call it quiet time uh, bible time whatever they call it just as you have that where you have your own time in the morning where you come before the word of God and you pray well, that's something we should do in our families isn't it some people would call it family altar we've always called it bible time term doesn't matter but what it is is a time coming together round the word of God it gives the children an important opportunity to ask questions or for the father or the mother to explain something from the sermon perhaps or something from whatever to explain things from the word of God it should never be negative. Yeah, you know, we considered recently um, came up in a message about work and toil, and there's a difference. Work is actually a good thing. Toil is part of the curse. Toil comes with the curse. That family time together should never be seen as a toil, as something that oh, is something to be oh, grudged and, and not to have. And I hold my hands up here. I know in times I've failed in this. Because you can get so embroiled in the day. Things like that, if they don't happen, perhaps early or whatever, you get started on the day and I'm all go. And then suddenly, oh, I've got to stop now because it's... And you can give the wrong impression. I believe I have given the wrong impression. As though this is something that ah, is in the way. Yet it shouldn't be like that. So I hold my hands up. It doesn't have to be long canon in fact particularly when children are younger should be fairly short and yes primarily it should be the father who leads this can't always be the case but it should be primarily short prayer reading of a portion of the word of God maybe a, a brief explanation of what it means nothing more necessarily if 
followed by a prayer, maybe a song. But sometimes, and we've done this, sometimes it's good to have uh, what I'd call a, a special time. You, you know, you've got something special you want to say. I, I've done this where it's been probably over an hour, <laughs> a special time, but, but it's something you want to say. And it obviously has to be at a time where there is the opportunity to have more time. And maybe if there isn't generally time for everyone to pray, now is a time where the whole family can pray. But these things are important and should be part of the framework. And as I say, it's something that well, we've always done, but more recently, uh, with people out and about at various hours, it's become a struggle. <laughs> but you have to fight for these things. So that's a parent's ultimate call. But how about this as a third consideration? You're a parent. You're a Christian parent. Or you're observing Christian parents. What should be your aim? What do you think their aim should be? What should be your aim as you train? As you train in the ways of the Lord, what should be your aim? What should be your heart's desire? Do you know, I read this last week. Every parent ultimately wants their child to get a good job and lots of money. Ultimately, hey, that's what we all want, isn't it? That's what this statement said. (laughs) No, not at all. Is that what you want? Really? Can there be anyone here who aspires to be a parent? That you would want that more than anything for your child? For your children? Anyone here who is a parent? Anyone here who's been a parent? Was that what you wanted more than anything else? Well, I have to say, if, if that's what you ultimately want for your children, I've got nothing to say to you. The Bible has nothing to say to you. Only to warn you. Only to warn you, and really in thinking of how to warn such a parent, well the parable that comes most to mind is bigger barns. Go and build your bigger barns. There's a man who's wealthy, he's got so much money he doesn't know what to do with it, so he says, I'll build bigger barns. And store up all my goods there. Then I can take life easy. And oh, what's he done? He's got a good job. He's rich. But Jesus says to him, that very night... His life is demanded of him. And God says to him, you fool, you fool. You fought all your life for worldly wealth, material things. And yet you had not one thought towards God. That's the person, that's the parent's desire, that's the child's aim who's raised to just get a good job and money. The ultimate aim in life. Now you must give an account to God. I said the parent's ultimate call is a duty to train and instruct their children in the ways of the Lord. Yet there is a higher aim, an ultimate target beyond instructing them in the ways of the Lord. The ultimate desire for the Christian parent is that their child or their children Come to truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. And by that I mean experience conversion. By that I mean come to a point of salvation in Christ. Where Christ is all. And that raises a danger. That brings a danger for us parents. Because one danger is that you, you, kind of, you so long for them to be saved. You, you kind of force them into a point where they make a profession of faith. Now, most children raised in a Christian home will make that profession of faith as to whether it's genuine or not. That's one of the hardest things to determine, isn't it? It's best kind of left until they grow and show more clearly signs that this is real, this is genuine. But what they don't need is you to kind of corner them. Because children will do what they believe pleases you. So hence, the remote control. (laughs) They'll do what pleases you, won't they? I want you to become a Christian. I will. I will. I'll become one then if that's what you want. 
Let me give you an illustration, but it's a slightly different to children. It's the husband and wife thing again. We know a man who was converted. I don't know how his wild his life had been before, but he was married. He was converted. His wife wasn't. He nagged and nagged and nagged his wife about coming to church. He nagged and he nagged and he nagged his wife about her need for Christ. And one time, he actually got on his knees in front of her and was crying and tears were pouring out from his eyes. And he was saying, I don't want you to go to hell. She chucked him out. Chucked him out of the house. And you had to say, I don't blame her. I don't blame her. That's really not the way to approach things. So we shouldn't force We shouldn't try and force these things on people, particularly on our children, who are so impressionable. And we should also avoid calling them Christians. Shocked me one time, a church we went to, that they they had a Sunday school, and it was after the second hymn, the children went out, but they treated them all as Christians. We Christians together. They sung hymns and songs for the children as though they were Christian, but you know, we... You can kind of do that because a lot of the words that you sing have that sort of connotation in them. But, but they were treating them as though they were Christians. And they weren't bringing the gospel. And if I'm following the path that says, oh, the Sunday school teacher is the ultimate guide for my children. They're the ones to give the instruction. Well, my children would never have known the gospel. And would think that just by the fact that they're in a home that's a Christian and they go to church, therefore they're a Christian. Which raises another giant danger, that the child themselves assumes they're a Christian. They're raised in this Christian home, they look at others, maybe at school or whatever, that aren't raised in a Christian home, and they see that they don't have such good principles, such good morals as I have as a child raised in a Christian home. And it's that I'm raised in the name of Christ, so therefore I must be a Christian. Let me try to draw things to a close by saying this. That the gospel is for all time. Not just Bible time. By that, I'm talking of you raising your children. The gospel, yes, comes in at Bible time, comes in at the family altar, call it what you will. But it doesn't stop there. It's for all time, not just Bible time. I said before that word training, to teach by act or action and discipline. Let's come back to the word action, training, action. If we think of training our children, the action is that it should be matched by our life. That we as parents are holiness to the Lord. We've been set apart from the world. And we should be displaying in the home and to our children set apart living. Godly living. If we as parents only speak the gospel in this family Bible time or whatever, if we only speak the gospel and we don't live it, as our children grow, they'll realise that we're hypocrites. Just hypocrites. That's all we are. And all the good words that may have been said in those Bible times will be completely undone. Just like the lady who came to us one time and said, The reason why she didn't believe in God was because when she was a child, she was raised to believe in Father Christmas. And the parents went to all sorts of intricate levels to display that Father Christmas was real and so on. And then when she got older and discovered the truth, it just blew it all up. And she thought, well, if they lied about that, they probably lied about God as well. That was her point in it. But the point I'm making now and using that illustration to make is this, that if we we talk about these things, we talk about the gospel, yet we don't live it. We're just like those parents who raise their daughter on the belief in Father Christmas. It's a lie, isn't it? If we don't live it, we're just hypocrites. How your children see you in church is how they should see you at home. You might have taken the tie off. You might have... um, 
I don't want to use the word lounge pants on, but no, that seems to be a, a fashion that some people wear today, isn't it? Yeah, you may have um, you know, dressed down, as it were, but your mind shouldn't dress down. Think of act. Teaching through action. Think of our approach to bringing them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. How am I going to go about it? Well, I'm going to put myself in their shoes. This will help me. Put myself in their shoes. In other words, try to understand things from their perspective. Or rather, put myself in their shoes. How would I like to be disciplined in this? They've done long perhaps. How would I like to be disciplined? I don't mean to say that, well, I wouldn't want to be disciplined at all, therefore I won't discipline them. It doesn't mean that. I'm not saying that. No one wants to rebuke. But, what we want is in bringing that for them to come to a point of understanding of why they've been rebuked. And therefore it needs to be done in love, doesn't it? In love. Just as it says in Hebrews, we read in verse 11, first of all, and then we'll go back, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful, it must be there. It doesn't seem painful, we don't want it, and, uh, you know, we, well, we wish we'd never had it, but we have to do it. And it's the right thing to do, but then you look at verse 6, the Lord disciplines those he loves. And punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So we put ourselves in their shoes. How best can we do this? So that they receive it in the right way. It doesn't have a negative effect. And sometimes that might mean that we have to deal with ourselves first. You see the point I'm making is that if you come at your child because they've done this. I am so never had to. Then that's not how you would want to be approached. If I upset my wife by... Uh, dropping her favourite mug on the floor and smashing it. And she said, I wish I'd never married you. <laughs> I feel terrible. I feel terrible. I know she wouldn't say that, she'd just say, it's only a mug, that's not crying. You know? but, <laughs> but I don't feel terrible. She's gone over the top. I, I've done wrong. I need to be shown my wrong, perhaps, but I want it to be done in a way that doesn't destroy me, doesn't kill me. Well, Therefore, I'm not going to say such a thing to my child, am I? I'm going to do it in love. Sometimes, if I'm angry and have that lack of control, then all I need to do is deal with myself first. Get that control. So I can have a clear focus. Remembering, as I said last week, and as the Word of God says, not only self-control, but love is a fruit of the Spirit. And then you think of action, training, this word training, uh, part of it meaning by action... Teaching by action. Your child has been naughty. You're tired. They've been naughty. It needs to be dealt with. What are they? You say, well, pain in the neck. Pain in the neck. What is this now? Oh, I could do without all this. I really could. What a pain. Oh, no. But that's not the way to look at it. Because actually, and I know it's easy to say and far harder to do, but this should be our aim as parents. You see, they've done something wrong, they've been naughty, but we're teaching them by action. This is a gospel opportunity. It's an opportunity to bring the gospel beyond the Bible time. Now it's applied faith, it's applied theology. You're, you're teaching theology, now you're applying it, aren't you? Through action. You're to constantly and gently teach and apply the gospel. Godly discipline is not that you just whack. That's it, that's sorted you out. Now go to your bed screaming and crying and you're not having any tea either. You don't just whack them. You need to show them how they have sinned. What they have done wrong. Now I'm not talking sometimes of an instant chastisement needed because of the situation and what have you. But a child should always be brought to a point where they understand what they've done wrong. They understand why it is they're being punished. And that ultimately, they've sinned against God. Ultimately, all things that we do that are bad, ultimately is against God, isn't it? 
And there's a wonderful opportunity to apply the gospel. To teach them and to show them the need for Christ. And it's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity as well. If you're someone who, in that chastisement, uses a smack or something, it's a wonderful opportunity to say, well, look, though this may must happen to you because you've done wrong here, let me tell you this. How much more the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for our naughtiness in our place, yet he had done nothing wrong. Oh, child, do you see? Do you see the love that God has for you? It's a wonderful opportunity. It shouldn't just be seen as a grudge and a pain. It's good, isn't it? It's a good opportunity to bring the gospel, to teach them and show them their need of Christ. And so, to finish, if as a parent, our deepest desire Our greatest longing is that our children come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If as Christians, our deepest longing is that our nieces and our nephews, our cousins and our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our whole family. If as Christians, our friends, our acquaintances, our colleagues. If our ultimate desire is for them to come to know Christ. Then what people of prayer do we need to be people of prayer and what people as well of patience there are times when it's not appropriate to be speaking the gospel patience is called for and wisdom isn't it so we're back to Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Holy Spirit it calls for prayer and for patience in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 12 we read no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it so don't give up don't give up whether it's a family member now don't give up praying for them. but here obviously I'm taking it out of context because the context is in the training and the disciplining and we're thinking in the training and disciplining primarily of our children don't give up pray, be patient be patient, commit them to the Lord commit them to the Lord remembering this that ultimately he loves them more than you do Amen.